Welcome to First Baptist Church. Our passage today is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Here are some of our church announcements. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We are in 2 Peter chapter 1. Truth needs to be repeated or it will be replaced by a lie. The heart of man is prone to wander and in doing so, it quickly forgets where it's from. Knowing this, God has established some reminders to help us to return to where we came from. Let me share a couple of those reminders that help us think back and return to where we belong. One of those reminders from the Old Testament is the Day of Purim. It's a day of remembrance. It commemorates the saving work of God on the nation of Israel. It was a time in which a wicked and evil man by the name of Haman plotted to wipe out and kill all of the Jewish people. And in fact, God turned his wicked plans against him and caused his own plans to be turned on him and destroyed him. So every year, Perm is remembered and remembered. And in that remembering, that although someone devised an opportunity to destroy the people of Israel, in fact, they were saved. 
But there's another set of remembrances. There were 12 stones that were set aside. And these 12 stones were to be a memorial for the nation of Israel, for the children of Israel. That each time as they were traveling back and forth, they were to be pointed out and to remind the children of Israel that when Joshua brought the children of Israel into the land of promise for the very first time, they came across the Jordan on dry land. That God had fulfilled his promise. And it was to be a reminder. Perhaps the greatest of these reminders is Passover. Now whether a person is a practicing Jew or not, Every Jew seems to be aware of the day of Passover. It is perhaps the greatest reminder of God's redeeming power to the people of Israel. It is in that day in which God told Moses that a Passover would be set and sacrifice would be given. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 27, Moses records, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the house of Israel when in Egypt, while they were in Egypt, and he struck the Egyptians and he delivered their households. What is the one thing that you would like to have your children remember about your faith or your culture or even your family? Is there one truth that you wish for them to learn and to keep for their entire life? Well, Peter does. And Peter states that in 1 Peter, or excuse me, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of the apostles of the Lord, of our Lord and Savior. Our passage today is going to address Peter's desire to stir up our minds by way of reminder. And in order to do so, the first thing that we're going to look at is it's going to start with our need to remember the truth. And then we're going to look at the responsibility to, to the truth. And then finally, the preservation of the truth. And so as we do that today, we're going to start with the remembrance of the truth. When we hear phrases like, remember the Alamo, or remember the Maine, or remember Pearl Harbor, these stir up emotions in the people's hearts and minds. And it associates certain emotions with the time and the events with those particular people. When we think of things like remember the Alamo and Pearl, we're not really connected with that time period and the specific things that were going on. Now we see it from a historical perspective, but we're not living in that time period. But Peter wants us to know that he is trying to stir up our minds in the present truth. So when he writes in verse 12, he says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. He wants us to know the truth, and he states we, we do know the truth, and we are established in the truth. So, to remember the truth, there's this certain amount of, of information that Peter is saying, look, as believers, you already know the truth, and I'm just helping you to recall these things. I want you to remember these things. So as we know the truth, in our day and age, truth has become more of a philosophical argument. Who can really know truth? When Jesus stood before Pilate, he said to him, Jesus speaking, said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And what was Pilate's response to Jesus? What is truth? Wow. How unfortunate to have the truth standing right before you and to completely miss it. 
You see, Jesus doesn't declare that he is a truth or he's one of many opportunities of truth. In John chapter 14, 6, Jesus emphatically states, I am the truth. And that tells us in regards to the origin and the source that Jesus is, in the larger picture, he's truth. You can, there is not a conflicting of truth. He comes and says, if you want to know the answers, I have them. In fact, not only do I have them, I am the truth. And Pilate misses that. But Peter makes sure and wants us to recognize that as believers, we know the truth. And he pulls out by stating that these particular believers, they are aware of the truth. And he points back all the way back to verse 1. He says, To those who have obtained a like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So right there, Peter is already identifying and saying, as believers, you know the truth, and that truth is you, that you're aware of refers back to your salvation. But Peter also recognizes their knowledge of truth in regards to the apostolic teaching. Now, what do I mean by apostolic teaching? It means though, those things that when we talk about the faith, what did the apostles teach? What did they lay out for believers to know? Remember when Peter, Peter's writing this, the entire New Testament had not been gathered together. At this time, the Gospel of John had not been written. The book of Revelation had not been written. Many books have not been written. But Peter does acknowledge Paul. So if you turn in your Bibles to chapter 3, verse 15, he mentions Paul by name and some of his letters, but it, although he doesn't mention specifically which letters, he says, and consider that some long-suffering of the Lord's salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to, this, to the wisdom given to him, was also written to you, as also in all epistles, speaking in them of things in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of Scripture. So, Peter is recognizing that his reader, the ones that he wrote first and second uh, Peter to, also have received letters from the Apostle Paul. Who might this be? Is it the Galatians? Maybe. We don't know for sure. But they are a group of people that are in Asia Minor. We know that from first Peter because he identifies who this group is. And so there's a number of churches that this church that this letter is written to. So as he's stating this, first they are to know the truth. And then afterwards, the truth is to be established. And to be established means to be strengthened or to be confirmed. Again, back in verse 12, it says, You know and are established in the truth or in the present truth. Peter was to confirm or uh, the truth in the disciples after he had denied Christ. Here's something that really caught my attention. That when Christ was talking to Peter and telling Peter that he was going to deny him, he then tells Peter that when you come back to me, First, you're going to deny me. You're going to reject me. But when you come back to me, I want you to gather up the other apostles, the other disciples, and I want you to confirm them. I want you to strengthen them. I want you to establish them back in the faith. Huh. So how does Peter do this? Peter takes the stories, the truth, the time that Peter and the other apostles had spent with Jesus walking throughout the land of Israel and he uses that information. He takes basically what Jesus had taught them and said, guys, remember what he taught us. Remember what he showed us. Remember what he did. These are all things that point that he really is the Messiah and he has proven it to us. He's God. So, 
How do we, how do we become established in the presence faith? Well, to do so, let me remind you about the faith. What is salvation? What is the gospel? What is baptism about? What is communion about? What is sharing your faith? What is the basics of Christianity? Do you believe that Christ is returning again? Do you believe in creation? Do you believe that the Bible is God's word? Do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Do you believe that Jesus is God? These are all basic things of the faith. And as we learn about them, and as we're reminded of the truth of them, that helps us to become established and more confident in our faith. So why should we be so adamant about our faith? Well, for one thing, as we look to our second point, there's a responsibility to the truth. Peter talks about that in, next, in their next passage, verse 13. But our responsibility to the truth is to stir up others. James goes so far as to call it a sin if we know what's right and we fail to do it. Peter, in verse 13, he says, Yes, I think it is right, so long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. Truth requires action on our part. To stir up means to awaken or to arouse. Picture, you will, someone sleeping on the couch. You need to wake them up. You need to increase your volume or you need to come up and physically shove them and push them to get them out of their slumber and, and get them awake. It's the same word that's used of the Sea of Galilee that's completely still and a, a stormy wind comes in through the valley and it breaks up the calm water into a fierce wave cap, uh, torrent stor or stormy waves. What was once at peace becomes uh, frightfully active. Your mind and my mind can become docile, flat, and just lazily tired if we are not pushed into action by words. So the meaning or the method, I should say, that Paul, excuse me, that Peter uses to stir us up is that of memory, of, of recalling memories. As we look at the memories that he's speaking to perhaps of his readers here, he might be using the memories of them coming to faith. Now, we're not told that Peter is the one who led these people to faith, but if it was during Paul's first missionary trip, then we would be back in Acts chapter 13 and 14. And if you have your Bibles with you, turn to, that, turn to Acts uh, 13 and 14, because I want to point out just a few things there uh, for you to see. And this is a passage where Paul has taken some others and they, they are going out and Paul is determined to share the gospel with whoever will listen. And so he's coming into different areas and he's sharing Christ. And people are responding. So perhaps Peter's recalling, remember how someone came to you and you didn't know who they were, but they were sharing the gospel and you became believers. He might be also using the memory of God's faithfulness. One, starts, one sort of passage that's, that is very fascinating of, of recognizing God's faithfulness is in Acts chapter 14, where they're talking about the preaching of the gospel at Derbe. It says, Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium, they came there having persuaded the multitudes. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and he went to the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas for Derby. God is so faithful to his word. God is so faithful to his people 
And God is so faithful to, to make sure that other people who have never heard about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he sends messengers to them. And although it seemed like Paul was dead by being stoned, giant rocks are picked up and thrown and cast on the person, that we see that Paul is delivered and he moves on to the next location to continue preaching and teaching. Now that we see, maybe the memories are of God's forgiveness. There was a man in Lystra who was crippled from his birth and he had never walked. And yet, here this man was, uh, was healed of his afflictions and he was able to walk again. Maybe that's the memory that they are recalled. Or maybe it's the memories of God's purpose and plans that were restored to them. In verse 27 of Acts 14, it says, Now when they had come and gathered to the church, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Maybe that's what is being spoken of in this passage. That these are memories of God's purpose and plan. That not only did the good news of Jesus Christ come to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles. Maybe that's what Peter is bringing back to everyone's attention to say, hey, this is the memory tool that is causing the believer to go, yes, that's right. These are all the things that God has done. Because in doing so, it causes a response. Not only as we look at that, not only should we be um, have a responsibility to stir other people up, we also have a responsibility to use our time wisely. One, because our time is limited. Peter is speaking about his coming death in verse 14. He says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. By, by using the phrase, I must put off this tent, he's really referring to a metaphor that everybody would recognize in the day, that period of time, in, that, in those days. Because tents really represented and symbolized a sense and a feeling of one's residency of being temporary, that you're constantly on the move. And Peter also reminds them that Jesus himself told them that Peter was going to die and how he was going to die. He says, when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hand and someone else is going to gird you up and carry you where you don't want to wish or where you, where you don't wish to go. And speaking of that, he's talking about uh, being crucified. Church history states that Peter was crucified upside down because he felt that he was not worthy to be crucified as his Lord and Savior. Our time also belongs to God. Not only is our time limited, but our time belongs to God. God has given us a certain number of days. We are limited to how many we have, and if God has given us this amount of time, that God has also given you and I the responsibility and the opportunity to use those days that he's given to us. God wants us to use those days and that time for his honor and for his glory. The real question comes into, are you using the days that he's given to you for his honor and glory? If it's real easy to figure out how many days that we have available to us. We know how many days there are in a year. We can calculate that by 10. Say there's how many we have in a decade. And we're told that on average that everybody has 70 years of life. Well, how old are you? How much time do you have left? The clock is running. What are you doing with the time that God has given to you? Maybe you're over 70 and you're saying, I'm on borrowed time. Yep, you're on bonus time. Well, again, what are you doing with the time that God has given to you? The third point we want to bring up is we want to focus on preservation of the truth. Peter states in verse 15, he says, Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things, after my 
departure or after I've died or, or I'm deceased. What is the record of these things? What are these things that he is referring to? Because he uses it in verse 15. He also uses it in verse 12. If we stay in the content, context of our passage, and that's really what we want to do, these things have a referent. They go back to something in this chapter. And as good biblical scholars, what we want to look at is we want to find that reference, that referent. Specifically, this referent goes back to verse 5 through 7. These things, meaning... For this very reason, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perfect perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. These are the things that we are to be reminded of. These are the things that we are to have in our life. Each believer needs to be actively working towards adding these things, these characteristics, these traits to their own life, to their own walk, to their own, to their own character. And Peter says, I want to make sure that you are reminded of them. How often do we need to be reminded of them? Well, I guess it really depends on how often that we forget them. Maybe we need to be reminded minutes or hours after a sermon. I don't really know. But Peter also makes, rec makes mention that there needs to be a record for the next generation. What do I mean by that? He says, for after, after I'm deceased or after I'm gone, I want to make sure that there's something solid, not just relying on my words, of talking to you and sharing, hey, you need to remember this, or I'm coming alongside and discipling you. Make sure you add knowledge. Make sure you add love. But let me have something that's going to last a little bit longer. Peter is concerned that there would be a succession of truth. That it would be passed on from one generation to the next, or one group of believers to the next set of believers. The succession of truth that's found here is the apostles' teachings. If we go back to chapter 3, verse 2, we see that would be what the prophets talked about and the teachings of the apostles. So taking that as a whole, what we're talking about is the Word of God. He wants to make sure that record there is kept and preserved. When we hear the word or the phrase apostolic succession, Often in theology, that means there, that's the method of transmission of authority from the Apostle Peter to the next leader of the Apostles or the next leader in the church, specifically to the Pope. In fact, the early church leaders were not concerned of that at all. What they were concerned about, and as you can read for yourself in these verses here, 12 through 15, Peter is very concerned about what he taught to be passed on to the next generation. He was not concerned of who would be his second, who would be the next person in line. And you, as you read through Scripture, you're going to find Scripture is not interested in a head of the apostle or head of the overall church because we have one. It's Jesus Christ. And the local churches have individual pastors to help lead those flocks recognizing the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, is ahead over everybody. So, the priority really is put upon the truth and the Word of God, not on the position of a leader. So here we are 2,000 years later, and we have a copy of Peter's letter. And that message that Peter wrote 2,000 years ago is just as clear today as it was then. His message Remember the truth so you can grow. So I ask you, are you remembering those things that will cause you to grow? What do you need to do today to help you grow in the Lord and in His walking with you?
Do you need to be reminded? Do you need someone to come alongside you and say, hey, let's spend some time together in His Word? Do you need to put a note on your refrigerator? Do you need to set your cell phone with an alarm on there to go off? Whatever you need to do, do it. So you're reminded and more of your mind is transformed by the renewing of His Word and less conformed to the present age that we live in. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, that uh, those who came before us cared enough about, about us to leave a witness for us and wanted to make sure that You were clearly um, you were a, a clear witness was left in regards to what you did, Lord, for us and what your character is. So many, Lord, will state that you are just a good teacher and you are a wise man, but that's really not what you stated through your word. You claim that you are God, and that challenges us to do something. We have to make a decision in our lives what that's going to be. We have to be willing to bend our knee to you and recognize that you are the Lord of our lives. And if that's the case, then we have to be willing to follow you. As those who are hearing my voice today and hearing your your message, Lord, will you stir in the hearts men and women, to follow after you, to be dedicated to you, to have a thirst for you. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In a few moments, you'll be joining your life groups. They'll have some questions for you that will hopefully be a challenge and encouragement to you. Do your very best to participate. Have a great day.